Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be finishing off the pre-operative management series. And today I'm going to be talking about perioperative medication management. I'm going to try and make this as high yield and you know fast paced as possible just to get to, through all the main medications that you're going to be managing for patients going to surgery. So let's get started. So the first class of medications I'd like to talk about is going to be aspirin or the antiplatelets. And in terms of these medications, you're often going to hold for five to seven days before surgery. This is based on this POISE-2 trial that was published in 2014. And basically it stated that among patients with elevated operative risk, perioperative aspirin does not reduce all-cause mortality or non-fatal MI. However, it is associated with an increased risk of major bleeding. So based on this trial, usually we are gonna hold it before surgery and you can usually restart 24 hours after surgery. Now, if you go on to UpToDate or read some more articles about this, then there are some actual recommendations for continuing aspirin if somebody has like prior stents or a cabbage and they're really high risk for having thrombosis of that stent again, for example. Uh, but I'd say in 90% or more of cases, you're gonna be holding aspirin five to seven days before surgery. Next up, we've got beta blockers. And this is gonna be a very, very common question that you're gonna get is what should we do with the patient's beta blockers before surgery? And the answer is to continue their beta blockers if they are already taking them. However, if the patient is not already taking a beta blocker, you don't wanna start a new beta blocker in this scenario, uh, unless you have at least like two to four weeks for it to really kick in. And that's because actually there's a couple of trials that showed that starting a new beta blocker was actually um, associated with increased rates of stroke and death. The studies which kind of led to these guidelines, if you're interested, is the POISE trial and the DECREASE trials. And so in the POISE trial, what they did was they started people on high dose metoprolol succinate, 100 milligrams right before surgery, like two to four hours, and then continued them on 200 milligrams daily thereafter. And so obviously that's a huge, huge dose. And those patients are the ones that had decreased risk of MI, but increased risk of death and stroke. And so it was bad to start beta blockers before surgery. The decreased trials, on the other hand, um, started bisoprolol, like a median of 34 days before surgery and slowly titrated it to a heart rate of 50 to 70. And they realize that there is actually a big benefit to doing that, a slow titration uh, over the course of several weeks. However, um, there has been a lot of criticism of the decreased trials because they've kind of had some falsified data and some misconduct and everything. But in general, continue beta blockers if patients are already taking them and don't start new beta blockers if it's pretty soon that they're going to be getting the surgery. All right, next up we have NSAIDs, and this is going to be a very easy one. Um, so commonly patients are going to be on NSAIDs, and you do not want to continue NSAIDs. You can continue them for lower risk procedures, but in general, you want to discontinue NSAIDs prior to surgery. Next, let's talk about anticoagulation. And this is going to be a very, very important topic to know because this is probably a majority of where the questions are gonna come regarding your patients. And uh, two main categories that you're really gonna see here is gonna be patients on warfarin and then patients on DOAX. For warfarin, we typically are going to hold five days prior to surgery. And the next topic to cover is does this patient need bridging? And this is gonna be kind of a whole topic in and of itself, but just to touch upon it very briefly, when you have a patient on warfarin, then say they have a procedure, um, let's say post-op day zero, and so we're gonna hold their warfarin uh, on post-op day negative five, basically, five days before surgery. And so this whole time period right here, they're not on any anticoagulation at all. And so there is a subset of patients in which we would want to do what's called a bridge, which is to continue some form of anticoagulation for them so that they don't develop a clot in that five-day period where they're not really on anticoagulation. And typically what we do this with is going to be with heparin products. Heparin is a lot quicker to, you know, come out of the system. So it's a lot easier for the surgeons, you know, the day before surgery, you're just going to hold the heparin and then it's going to be all out of their system by the time that they go to surgery, but they're still going to be therapeutically anticoagulated uh, that whole time. After the surgery, you're going to restart the warfarin. So restart warfarin but it takes uh, several days for the warfarin to get back up to a therapeutic INR of greater than two. So while this is happening, you're also gonna do a bridge as well until you get that um, uh, therapeutic INR again on that warfarin. So question is, 
does the patient really need the bridge that we see uh, before and after? And this was answered in a really seminal landmark trial called the BRIDGE trial. And I'll show a picture of that in just a little bit. But basically what this trial found is that the risk of them actually having a thromboembolic event in that interim period of five days is actually very, very low. And basically what the guidelines are showing us now is that you should really only bridge if their CHADS2 score and not the CHADS VAS score is um, five or more, five or six. And so this basically means the patient had to have had a history of a stroke or if their CHADS VAS score is seven to nine. Uh, other, co um, other common causes that you're gonna need to bridge is a mechanical mitral valve or a recent stroke or VTE in the last three months. If your patient does not have any of these criteria right here, then you should not bridge them. You should just hold their warfarin five days before surgery and then restart it on post-op day one. And so just to go over a quick graphic of this, so here you see uh, kind of a chart, this is from up to date of the uh, high thrombotic risks and moderate and low thrombotic risk. And you know, high thrombotic risk is people you should bridge. And then these ones are no bridging. And so when you take a look at this, you'll see any vitral, mitral valve prosthesis is going to be an indication for bridging. A CHADS2 score of 5 to 6, CHADS VASC score of 7 to 9, or a recent uh, stroke or TIA within three months, or a recent VTE within three months. Also, you have those severe thrombophilias as well. These are all going to be patients that you do want to bridge. But otherwise, all these patients here who are low and moderate thrombotic risk do not need to go um, undergo a bridge and actually increases the risk of bleeding if you do decide to bridge these patients with heparin. All right, so that, that was a quick little bit about bridging in terms of warfarin. And then the other thing that we really need to discuss, and sorry, this is going to take me a little bit to erase, but uh, reversing INR, because a lot of patients may come in with super therapeutic INR. And the quick answer to that is if there's any serious bleeding, then they should receive IV vitamin K as well as prothrombin uh, complex concentrate. If INR is greater than 1.5 or greater than 2 or so, and they have an urgent surgery, then you can give them um, basically oral vitamin K. Usually you would do 2.5 to 5 milligrams, and you would give them PCC if urgent, it, the surgery needs to be urgently done in less than 24 hours. Otherwise, you can just give the oral vitamin K. Keep in mind that when you give these doses of vitamin K, it may suppress the INR for a very prolonged time period. And so um, sometimes we tend to end, uh, you know, lean more towards the conservative side when dosing this, especially when I talk with pharmacy. Uh, we'll usually go on the lower side because sometimes you're just going to be stuck trying to get their INR therapeutic again uh, after you reverse it. And it's going to take many, many days. All right, so now let's go back and talk about DOAX. And DOAX are a lot simpler because you don't have to think about bridging at all for these um, conditions. So DOAX, you're basically just gonna hold one to two days prior to surgery. And so one day if it's a low risk procedure and two days if it's a higher risk procedure. If they're on dabigatran, um, then there's some renal impairment criteria where you may hold for an additional two days before that. And then again, you're going to restart one to two days after surgery as well. And a lot of times we defer to the surgeons about when the bleeding risk is appropriately low enough to restart. So here's uh, just a little graphic from UpToDate. And this is basically showing how for a high bleeding risk procedure, they're basically going to hold the DOAC for two days. They're going to hold it the day of the surgery and then maybe one more day and then resume the regular DOAC dose. And then for low bleeding risk procedures, they may just hold it one day before surgery, the day of surgery, and then they'll restart it right away after that. And then if you go online, you'll find some more guidelines just kind of going through the same kind of thought process. So you'll see that apixaban and rivaroxaban uh, for a high bleeding risk procedure, we are going to hold it for two days prior to surgery, and then we're going to start it a day or two after surgery. Uh, for dabigatran, you know, if they have renal impairment, then you're actually going to hold it for four days prior to surgery, and then you're going to restart it one to two days after surgery if the bleeding risk is appropriate. All right, and that's it for anticoagulation. So next, let's move on to ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So this is going to be another huge class that a lot of your patients are going to be on. And typically, you're just going to hold it 24 hours before surgery. The reason that we hold ACE inhibitors is because they are associated with intraoperative and postoperative hypotension. And so holding it that 24 hours before surgery is typically the practice you're going to do in 90% of cases. The one thing that you do want to do is make sure you do restart it after surgery because 
there has been found to have an increase in mortality, uh, 30-day mortality, if they are not restarted within 48 hours after surgery. For calcium channel blockers, these are safe to continue. For diuretics, such as Lasix or thiazides, like hydrochlorothiazide, we're typically going to hold this on the morning of the surgery as well. Again, this is because uh, it's going to increase the risk of hypotension. And so it's pretty easy. It's a lot easier for anesthesiologists to treat hypertension. And so we want to hold all these medications that may cause hypotension during the surgery. Um, but if a patient is, you know, frequently volume overloaded and it's very difficult to control or they're going into the surgery with a little bit of extra volume, then definitely feel free to continue. Then let's talk about insulin. So insulin, if the patient is taking like a long acting glargine the night before, then you're just going to want to decrease that by 10 to 25 percent um, if taking a bedtime dose. And if they take a morning dose of a long acting insulin, then decrease by 33 to 50 percent if taking a morning dose. Again, this is to decrease the rates of intraoperative hypoglycemia or postoperative hypoglycemia, especially since the patients are going to be NPO uh, before the surgery. Uh, alpha-2 agonists like clonidine, you want to continue because there is a risk of withdrawal if you stop them. This is a commonly asked one, but SSRIs are also one that you want to continue. Uh, the risk that there is um, regarding these medications is that they slightly do increase the bleeding risk because obviously SSRIs interact with serotonin and your platelets actually use serotonin in part of their um, aggregation uh, process. And so you have a slightly increased risk of bleeding, but stopping the SSRI has a much higher risk of leading to a severe mood disorder episode or something like that, uh, which is higher than the slightly increased risk of bleeding. So you should continue these uh, perioperatively. Uh, let's talk about SGLT2 inhibitors. You should hold these three to four days before surgery due to the risk of euglycemic DKA and uh, UTIs and things like that. And other oral diabetes meds like metformin and sulfonylureas, uh, you really just need to hold those the morning of um, because uh, it's just basically that risk of hypoglycemia that day of, and then they continue that they can continue them afterwards. Statins should be continued as there is very low risk to these. And then just some kind of random other ones, H2 blockers or PPIs should be continued. And uh, digoxin should be continued. Uh, if you have niacin or azetamide, you should actually hold these because there is a slightly increased risk of rhabdomyolysis. OCPs should generally be continued unless there is a significantly higher risk of uh, thromboembolism. And um, we went over this in my previous video, but if a patient is on prednisone, if it is greater than five milligrams a day, then you should evaluate if they have any adrenal suppression and if they need any stress dose steroids. Otherwise, if it's just less than five, millig five milligrams or less, then they can just continue on that dose uh, without any stress dose steroids. That's pretty much my big list of medications that you're most commonly going to encounter in the perioperative setting. Uh, but we also have a lot of new uh, biologics and uh, monoclonal antibodies, which you may have questions about uh, because they're becoming more and more popular. And for that, I would highly recommend looking up this 2022 ACR AAHKS guideline for perioperative medication management. And you'll see a whole list of medications that are recommended to continue through surgery, such as methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, mycophenolate. I actually had a question about this one time. Uh, a surgeon was asking if this was going to affect wound healing. Uh, tacrolimus, all these immunos suppressive medications uh, should be continued. But a lot of these biologics and monoclonal antibodies, uh, they should actually be held uh, because of the significant increase in uh, infection uh, after surgery. So this is a very helpful list to uh, reference when you have patients on these medications. And that's pretty much it for my um, guide to medication management in the perioperative setting. Definitely the most important and most common ones you're going to encounter are going to be aspirin, beta blockers, anticoagulants, and then uh, blood pressure medications like ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. But hopefully this really helped you determine, uh, you know, the most common things that we're going to do before surgery for our patients. And because it is very hard to find a very comprehensive list of what you should do with all of these medications. And so if you want to do more reading on this and basically kind of confirm all of the stuff that we went over in this video, what I highly recommend is going to... Um, 
is going to up to date. And my favorite articles are this are going to be the one on perioperative medication management. And for this one, uh, you can very clearly look at each medication class, for example, beta blockers, alpha two agonists, calcium channel blockers, and you can really easily see the evidence behind their recommendations. Uh, in addition to that, then you have this management of cardiac risk for non cardiac uh, surgery, and this talks a little bit more about aspirin and beta blockers in the perioperative setting. Uh, perioperative management of patients receiving anticoagulants. This is another really, really important article that is going to help you when you're trying to figure out when to bridge somebody or how many days they should hold their DOAC. And then you also have this perioperative management of blood glucose in uh, adults with diabetes mellitus. So uh, very, very helpful and useful articles are out there online. I think this is all deeper reading that you can do that will really help you understand this topic a little bit better. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know down in the comments what you thought and if you have any questions. And I'm happy to hear what you guys think. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I hope to see you in the next video and I'll see you next time. Peace.